Welcome to week two of social marketing. Now one of the things that is a constant challenge in social marketing is defining the concept of good. So what you need to be doing as a social marketer is what you, you are constantly questioning the call as to what is good for society. Who gets to make that decision? And whether good is a grassroots up or a top-down implemented approach. And there are no good objective set ways of seeing this. There is no perfect good. There is no ideal form of social good. It comes down to the rationale, the argument, and the support. Which is not as big a cop-out as you'd like to think, but it does mean that very few social marketers operate to the premise of, I will engage in social evil, social bad. The consequences may be evil, the consequences may be bad, the consequences may be negative. But many social marketers will cheerfully enact policies, decisions, and protocols that they believe to be for the greater good, which do not have a positive outcome for that society, for other target audiences. Remember that our role is to change people, to change audiences. So sometimes when we roll into town promising good, it doesn't look like good to the people we intend to target. And this is one of your considerations, is what is good for society? And how do you set that up? So, with that cheery opening number, let's talk social problems. What you want to be doing out of this is you want to be thinking, what is a social problem? Who is involved in the social problem in terms of stakeholders and audience? And how do we spot one of these things so we can line it up and offer a social solution to it? Now, one of the big classic social marketing success stories, and don't tell the road safety people they've succeeded, they get awfully shirty about it. In 1970, the Melbourne Sun had the Declare War on 1034. Catchy, huh? 1,034 people had died on Victorian roads. We are not talking a national road toll, we're talking a state road toll. 1034. Now the thing is, you want to then go follow those links up to see how many people die on the roads on a regular basis now. But one of the things that happened is, back in that period, a problem, people are dying from driving cars. Or rather, people are dying as a side consequence of cars being driven. Here, the solution was mandatory seatbelt laws, which is the law side of the Rothschild Triangle. But it also brought in a whole series of other social marketing elements like speeding, drink driving, fatigue, distracted driving, and choices, choices not to engage in set behaviours. Yes, seatbelts became mandatory as items to be fitted in cars, but the use of seatbelts became a social marketing campaign to convince people that actually it was a really good idea to be attached to your car by a strap. It's worth noting at this point that in America, the reason why airbags were developed is that they were a counter competitive product to seatbelts. Seatbelts took away a driver's liberty Yeah, um, but seatbelts were a, a long-argued campaign about being compulsory 
and some places I'm not even sure they are compulsory, because a counterproduct of an airbag, of in the event of needing to have your body arrested from sudden momentum and movement, a small explosive device will power the inflation of a large cushion. Or you could tie yourself to your car. However it worked, this was a problem, it was identified, and solutions were put into effect. So the first thing is, question, what's the problem and why is it a problem? How bad is the problem and who does it impact? And in this one, it's not just direct, but also indirect. The next part of this is, okay, there's a problem. What's contributing to the problem? So the problem is people are dying from accidents involving automobiles. People are dying in road accidents. Okay, that's what's happened. What's contributing to the problem? Well, if the car stops, there's no way to stop you whilst you're inside the car. Okay, that's the contribution. Probably a solution is going to be an exploding cushion or strapping yourself to the chair. On the identify social issues though, one of the things you want to ask a question about is when you and this is media literacy. When there's a social issue, how do you know it's an issue? Where is the evidence? Who funded that evidence? And what do they stand to gain from this change? Now, media literacy requires you to question your own side and your opponent's side. And when we say question, we don't mean uncritically ignore evidence. We don't mean say, oh, well, you know, this was funded by someone, it's got to be bad. If an alcohol, if a pro-alcohol lobby funds research that says alcohol is great, you would critically question it. You go, hang on. The National Association of Selling Beer says beer helps fight cancer. You would probably question it. You'd ask, what's the evidence? How was it funded? How was it produced? At the same time, if the National Association of Sobriety fun produces a report saying beer is evil and a tool of the devil, you might also want to give it the similar sort of hang on. Who's put the money behind this and what do they stand to gain? Critical appraisal of evidence is vital as a social market. But critical appraisal does not mean you then have to dismiss something. You just have to make certain that what you're doing, you are doing with eyes open. Staying on the purpose question, what you also want to be thinking now is, okay, there's a social problem. We can put together a solution. What does it look like? What does the world look like if it all goes horribly right? What difference could it make? So you go, here is a problem. We are going to solve this problem. What does the world look like when the solution has been implemented? What difference could it make? And then you also have to do best case and worst case scenario, which I refer to as horribly right and horribly wrong. If it all works amazingly, spectacularly, successfully, what happens next? And this is the ultimate question. This is social problems and social solution. What's the end game? What is the outcome? Then what are the interim steps, the small steps, the interim wins, the incremental changes that get us to that point? This is the journey of a thousand miles question. If you are going to climb Mount Everest, end game is not 
the peak of Everest. Endgame is returning to base camp. The steps and the interim wins are leaving the base camp, are the, is the first step. Getting to the top of the damn mountain is the interim win. Getting back off that mountain is the end game. So you gotta think, what does it look like to make the success? What are the steps on the way? Because as a social marketer, you are playing for interim wins. You are playing the game for incremental changes. You are releasing product, social product and social solution with version numbers. You are looking at this and again, commercial marketing. When Microsoft released the first version of Windows operating system, they did not rub, not just dust their hands off and go, All right, job done. It's all over. We've, we've released an operating system. There were, it was the first step. There are incremental changes. There are upgrades, updates, patches, new versions, new iterations. So this is how it works as a social marketer. There isn't a singular end game. There's the long game. What you want to think about is when you build a campaign, you build a series of smaller solutions, sub-solutions. Targeted and focused, go after it, take it out, move on to the next one. So let's break out some of the old frameworks. Situation analysis. It's not a swap analysis. First thing that you need to consider as a social marketer is this is your permanent operating environment. You are in the cultural change business. Cultural forces are the most important thing that you will take on because you are going to change people's minds. You're going to change their behaviors. You will change the social dynamic in the way in which they operate, they engage with others. You're going to modify their lifestyles, you're going to modify their values, and you are possibly going to break their religion. Maybe, maybe not. You might not do this intentionally, but you want to be thinking about it in terms of what are the operative religions involved? Where are you coming from, from your own faith? And that includes the atheist community. You are as much a faith as everyone else if you are dogmatic about your beliefs and try to convert other people to not believing in things. That's a modification to religion. You also want to think about the commercial environment. Who are you up against? If you are changing the world, making the world use more recycled products, there's my, one of my favorite ones. If you are in the business of engaging people in product reuse, recycling, and gray markets, you're up against the entire industry that is predicated on growth by selling new products, selling existing products to current market. And also fashion. That, fashion's a real pain. Fashion's one of the hardest things you've got to find because it's insidious and it's cyclical. And it inspires this idea that you have to change what, see, change by season. You have to, like, oh, are you still supporting that cause? That's so last year. Fashion's a major cultural force. Don't overlook it, don't rule it out, understand it, work it, work with it. Second part of the macro environment, that, uh, well, this can be a problem. Technology can cause a lot of problem for social marketing because suddenly something that was completely not anything we cared about and let's say, per chance, take an enormous amount of food science. Things that were previously our friends, because everybody knew there was good fats and bad fats. 
And then it turned out there were facts that were sort of sometimes good. And then it turned out that there were some of the good facts caused cancer, and some of the bad facts blocked cancer, but caused heart disease, and oh god, we got complicated. So technology will occasionally just go find a thing that you didn't think was a, an issue before. The advent of mobile phones with smart technology created a whole series of new social campaigns around situational awareness. Situational awareness-based campaigns created their own problems. We suddenly, we're all looking around the place and paying attention to things, and we're all seeing problems where we were previously ignoring them. It works for good, it works for bad. And there's also the element of Sometimes the solution to your social problem hasn't been built yet. It might. It'll show up. Or, worse yet, you have a social problem solved. It's in the bag. It's done. It's dusted. And some fool develops a technology that causes you a new problem. Macro environment, demography, demographic forces. This is stock. This is commercial marketing trade. The thing you want to be very careful about here is that there are social marketing campaigns designed expressly to change population characteristics. You may be part of that campaign. Same for household composition. An extended social campaign was engaged to create the nuclear family because it was the most efficient for what we were trying to achieve with society. Same for employment. Employment has a social, cultural context. Think, what are these can you use? Macro environment, natural forces, welcome to your perpetual nemesis. Doesn't matter what your social cause is. Doesn't matter what your social campaign is. The natural environment is your enemy because it's a competitor for your resources. If you are in the business of an innocuous social change, you want people to drive safely. Now, no one's really arguing against driving safely. And you want people to slow down, you know, drive at 50 kilometers an hour, and you're in Queensland, and it's summer, and some fool of a lightning storm sets fire to a bush property, and next thing you know, there's fires everywhere. Yeah, the 50k an hour campaign is straight out of people's minds. They're gunning it to get out. Fair enough. But also, it's straight off the minds of everyone else. If there is a natural disaster that occupies mind space. People aren't thinking about your social cause when they're distracted by the planet trying to kill them or kill someone else or providing that interesting um, update in orange and red on the nightly news. So this can be a competitor both for resources but also for attention span. <sighs> There's no two ways about it. Politics is one of your biggest components of social marketing. Because we're out here to change society, we're not the only ones. Political marketing is a separate category from social marketing. But the thing to understand about the macro environment of politics is the shift towards the right, conservative, right-wing, authoritarian style governments has been an ongoing pendulum swing. The thing is, if you hit a hard point on the political spectrum to the right, it doesn't suddenly click, snap over and go to the left. It has to swing back through the center to make it to the hard edge of the left. The pendulum swing of society and politics is basically an element, it's beyond the scope of this subject, but effectively we are also players in this game. 
Social marketing is predicated on a quasi-libertarian understanding that the individual has the capacity to change society through their own acts. Now, where we differ from the libertarians is that as social marketers, we talk about group-based change where society benefits from everybody working together whilst also making it clear to the individual that there's something in it for them. So the social marketing does have a libertarian streak to it. It does have a, an element of personal control as its heart, but it's also done by big ticket government agencies for collective change. So we ain't completely libertarian, but we're not completely socialist either. It's ironic, social marketing is always called the left-wing social marketing subject. Other areas in the situation analysis you got to know about law. Okay, and I'm going to point out the two bullet points at the end. In any given element where there is a criminalized behavior or product, if you decriminalize, and we'll take alcohol, if you were to criminalize alcohol, a bunch of people would be very unhappy. If alcohol was illegal and you were to decriminalize it, there would also be a bunch of very angry people. So one of the things to consider when people are looking at the social marketing campaigns to enable the decriminalization of certain prohibited substances, particularly drugs, is who's currently making a fortune from selling this in a market environment that is conducive to high profit margins, high costs, luxury pricing, and limited distribution channels. And then think, how happy are they going to be to have to compete with Coles and Woolworths? Similarly, one of the other considerations you want to put in here is that if you are asking people to give up a product to change their behavior, for example, if you've decided that your, uh, your game plan is to implement radical veganism across by, as a social marketing campaign, there's going to be a lot of meat producing people with a bunch of spare cows and a lot of unhappiness with you. So this is the legal and less than legal forces are an area where you want to consider that competition will emerge. Your macro environment, your final macro environment, you really need to be paying attention to here is in stakeholder theory. The media will show up. They're just a factor. You can't get past them. They are there. And it's about your campaign's decisions to what extent you incorporate them as stakeholders and to what extent you basically sigh, roll your eyes and go, I'm aware of what the shock jock on the Sydney radio station said and I just don't care. The final part though is in the external public is if you are doing social marketing for the benefit of society, society gets a say in it. You actually have to convey that benefit and a benefit needs to accrue to society. All right, in this situation, you understand, situation analysis is a massive block of data. It's beautiful, rich, narrative data. It's good stuff. What you do with your situation analysis is you keep all of your notes. Because everything out of the situation analysis is going to help you with stakeholder, it's going to help you with market segmentation, it's going to help you with positioning strategy, it's going to help you with product design. You must retain your notes. You'll create a little summary skim version of it, and that is an internal sense of what do we do well and what are we vulnerable to, what is the big ticket thing that's out there that we can cash in on? And what's the big scary thing we're going to worry about? That's the SWOT analysis. Or rather, that's the SWOT report. 
A SWOT analysis is the processing of thinking through the internal and the external and coming up with these factors, and then you report it as strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. And then you hang on to your notes. The key thing that you want to think about is, what is my social problem? What difference will it make if I change this? And this is where we want to bring up a couple of critical ideas. The branch chain diagram of products brings forth ideas, behaviors, and objects. And ideas are a really important component here because we're going to go change the world. What do people believe? What are their attitudes and what are their values? And that becomes a completely vital part of identifying a problem. Is the problem that people don't know enough? Is the problem that there is a lack of awareness? Is the problem that there is a solution out there, but it's kind of complicated and needs instructions? So knowledge consists of the logic, the information, stats, facts. It's non-persuasive but it's designed to fit a gap. What, what we keep coming across, and what you'll keep seeing people doing, is there's a whole area of health promotion and education that is based on the premise that if we just tell them the right answer, they'll know to do the right thing. Facts don't motivate. If they did, the world would be so much easier and Wikipedia would be the most powerful force in the known verse. The multiverses even. But realistically, statistics about risk are just providing the odds for gambling. Statistics on the likelihood of proposed benefits are awkward because then people can start seeing how unlikely things are. Humans don't process risk rationally. And this is the quote of de jour of don't bring a fact checker to a culture war. Facts have a role for audiences that are driven by fact, but they're non-persuasive. Where facts are really useful is where there are technical instructions or where you're looking at getting distribution, getting people to access available distribution channels. That's what facts do well. But critically in this is that facts can set up the problem. We can see that there is a problem because the statistics are showing us a problem. And this is a critical difference between being a social marketer and a consumer of a social marketing campaign. As social marketers, facts and stats and information drive our decision making. They can become our belief of an inherent good. We know that there's a 37.2% chance. And to us, it's really, really important because that's, that's more than one in three. Now to our audience, they're like, yeah, two out of three times, I'm good. But to us, these are drivers, these are motives, these are motivations. And we've got to be careful that we don't bring them to the market without support. They've got a role, they can show a problem. This, this though, this is us, this is marketing. Because this is what we do best. We know from services marketing theory that perceptions govern reality. The zone of tolerance is a theoretical framework tried and tested in commercial marketing operations up and down the world in a variety of socio-cultural contexts that simply point out what we expect versus what we perceive will determine how good a service is to us.
perception will govern our reality. As a social marketer, what we do then is we look at someone's perception and treat it as a product. So what someone believes to be true is effectively real in their life. If you are going to convince a conspiracy theorist that, in fact, the world isn't run by a small cabal of aliens headquartered out of the Swiss mountains, you have to understand why they value that idea, why that belief as a truism is important and effective in their life. Now, in the case of conspiracy theorists, what they're looking for is they're looking for order. They're looking to make sense of chaos. They're looking for certainty. To know that the world is unstructured, uncontrolled, and unregulated is not something that they can deal with. I, it, if it was something they could deal with, they wouldn't be seeking to layer over structured order. They wouldn't be assuming that everything had to be controlled from some central all power. Knowing that, we can substitute. We can provide them with a product alternative. So if they have a reality and it differs from your reality, you have to understand it. It becomes the central hub of the problem you're trying to solve. If you're trying to bring them from their reality to your reality or to reality as we just sort of mostly generally agree with it, for example, climate change, this is where the term reality-based community came in, by the way, is the people, the cultural influencers who went, you know what, we are aware that reality exists, but we're also aware that people perceive and what they perceive to be real is real to them, and that's good enough for us. They smashed social marketing out of the park on a regular basis until we realized it was time to fight fair. We'll meet them on their ground. So what a person believes to be true is the truth for them. That truth is what you need to operate from. If you are going to change their behavior, you must address that belief and you must address it by substituting it with an equally valuable to that individual substitute belief. Because every belief objective, every problem you're trying to solve, every social problem that you can see has an inversion state. And that inversion state is your competition. If you are trying to stop someone from smoking cigarettes because cigarettes will give them cancer, that cancer isn't what they're caring about. That cigarette is giving them immediate direct benefit that they may have to pay off later. They are putting their lungs on credit card. And unless you can give them instant, immediate gratification, you're not substituting, you're not dealing with their reality. They know what they're doing and they're betting on a future. They're betting on a repayment occurring far enough down the track that they'll have had enough benefit to have made it worthwhile. So each belief objective, every element that you are looking at trying to solve a problem if you perceive it as a problem, someone else perceives it as an opportunity. And this is where the SWOT analysis is also really important. Strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. Every opportunity you see as a social marketer is a threat. Just, it's someone else's threat. If you want to convince someone that their reality is wrong, then they currently believe their reality to be right, don't they? So this is your challenge. You've got to identify your problem and then frame your problem. But understand that every problem is someone else's opportunity. The other element in this that's critical in trying to identify a social solution is that you need to ensure that your audience can see 
or perceive that their actions will have a consequence. This is why in social marketing I hammer home decisions have consequences. Because you have to pitch consequence to an audience. You have to pitch good consequence, bad consequence, and will happen soon consequence, and it's happening now consequence. But if you want to present a solution to an audience, that solution has to be broken down in a way that the audience feels the acts they're being asked to undertake will make a difference, will step them towards solving that overall problem. It will also have to have the pricing right, that the cost that they're going to incur will have some form of gain. Those costs will be minimal. But the other aspect that you need to look at in your social solution, and this is your ethics. This is the ethics and this is the limit of social marketing. When we ask individuals to act, we must ensure that they have a right to behave in that way. If you're going to ask someone to undertake a behavior, that behavior needs to at least be moral, if not legal, or at least moral to your campaign. It's preferably legal. But also, you want to be considering the ethical ramifications of the desired outcome of your campaign, do your target audience have the right to experience this outcome? Do others have the right to experience the same outcome? What are the ethical considerations of the solution that you are trying to deliver? And what are the ethical, what are the current ethical considerations of the problem as it exists? And how do these get entangled in the solution you're providing? So if you are going to bring forth a social marketing campaign that encourages individual behavior for personal benefit in the name of an objective of overall aggrandized social good, that will clash straight up with any collectivist ideal that exists. Any idea that for your own personal benefit is an important factor but also where decision-making processes, asking children to sit, to situate themselves independently of their parents is to challenge the authority of the family structure. I'm saying again, oh, we're not gonna do a campaign like that, except every health campaign that asks kids to engage in healthy eating or to nag their parents to go out and exercise or to ask their parents to change their diet or to ask their parents not to Every time you get the child to question the parents, you challenge the family structure. Do you have a right to do that? Does the child have a right to challenge the family structure? Does the family structure have a right to expect obedience from the child? These are the open-ended questions that brings you back to that top-end order query. What is good? So. Started cheery, ended cheery. As always, if you need me on the email, come see me. Hashtag on the Twitter or off the Instagram. Get in touch if there's questions. Feel free to connect because it's important. As you are trying to identify problems, you try to work through solutions, they can be big, difficult challenges. And I've got a lot of my match practice at dealing with these challenges. So come, come by the office, talk to me, workshop the ideas, run through the scenarios, and let's see what we can make. Because changing the world is something I do.